Hi there! In all my previous videos I mostly covered analog components and circuits, putting aside all the digital electronics. I believe it is time to fill this hole and to do so I decided to start a new series on fundamentals of digital electronics. In this series I will start from the very basics and I will move on illustrating first the building blocks of the digital circuits and then continue the discussion introducing circuits more and more complex like flip-flops, counters, multiplexers and the like. Each episode of the series will add a little more theory than the previous one but will also showcase some digital circuit that you can build on your own and experiment on the subject. Today I will talk about the very basics and will show you how to build a simple device that will be very useful in your own lab when working on digital devices. Let's get into it. Hi there, I am Carlo Carrano and this is Electronics Engineering Made Easy. Let's start with the definition of digital electronics, and for that let me cite the very beginning of the Wikipedia entry. According to Wikipedia, digital electronics is a field of electronics involving the study of digital signals and the engineering of devices that use or produce them. This is in contrast to analog electronics and analog signals. Digital electronic circuits are usually made from large assemblies of logic gates often packaged in integrated circuits. Complex devices may have simple electronic representations of Boolean logic functions. Ok, but what are these digital signals Wikipedia is talking about? Digital signals are those that can assume only two preselected values, normally identified with the words high and low. High usually stands for high voltage, like the one that powers the circuits, while low stands for a low voltage value, like usually the ground level. Signals that can assume only these two values are called digital, and the electronic circuits that are only capable of dealing with such signals are called digital circuits or logic circuits. Now that we have defined the digital signals, what are the analog signals instead? How to differentiate it between digital and analog? Well, Analog is in fact an abbreviation. The full term is analogic, which means not logic. Analog signals are all those signals that can have an infinite number of values between the supply voltage and the ground, or even higher and lower than those, respectively. They are those signals that we have always seen in most of the previous videos on this channel. Basic circuits in the analog world are built with resistors, capacitors, inductors, transistors, and so forth. Basic circuits in the digital world, instead, are those called logic ports or logic gates, which are basically made with transistors working in the saturation region, so that they can be only off or on, and therefore giving only two possible signals, the low one and the high one. Now, besides the possibility of actually making logic ports with transistors, we normally use pre-made ports packed in integrated circuits. And finally, while we sometimes need to use complex mathematics to deal with analog circuits, in the digital world we use only Boolean operators, which behave very similarly to the arithmetic operators like plus and minus. This actually helps a lot, because it is much more simple to deal with digital circuits than it is with analog circuits. Well, well, of course this is more a subjective statement, somebody may disagree with that. And actually, why don't you share your thoughts with all of us in the comments? Back to our discussion, we said that, for the most part, digital circuits are available in the form of integrated circuits. And there is in fact a great compatibility on this kind of components, although made by different manufacturers. The thing is that digital circuit and signals are standardized, so it is easy to mix and match components from different companies, different vendors, to build a specific circuit. There is one thing, though, that we need to be careful about. We said that logic ports are made of transistors, but there are different types of transistors, and in particular we use for the logic ports the bipolar transistors, or BJT, and the field effect transistors, or a particular kind of those, the MOSFET. With the bipolar transistors, we can build logic circuits usually named TTL, or transistor-transistor logic. These circuits are essentially made of transistors and resistors. 
With field effort transistors instead, we can use together N-channel and P-channel MOSFET transistors to create a simple logic gates. Remember that MOS means metal oxide semiconductor. The technology used by these transistors is named CMOS or complementary MOS, because for each port we use one N MOS transistors and one P MOS transistor. One is the complement of the other, and no resistors are involved. The digital circuits that use these components are said to be part of two different families, the TTL family and the CMOS family. But why there are two of them? Well, the first digital circuits were TTL, actually, even before that there were the RTL and the DTL circuits, but those are now obsolete, so we play only with TTL circuits now. They use a lot of space on the chip dies because they have to implement also the resistors to correctly polarize the transistors in the saturation zone. But once the MOS technology became easier to use, the CMOS logic ports were created, and in these, the two transistors are usually connected one against the other, so that when one is on, the other one is off. This eliminates the need of resistors, since the off transistor behaves like infinite resistance, and it also reduces drastically the power needed to make circuits work. A CMOS circuit can easily consume between 1000 and 1 million times less power than the corresponding TTL circuit. And in addition, CMOS circuits use less space on the die, allowing putting more components than TTL circuits in the same space, as you can see from these pictures. There is a catch, though. CMOS devices are more difficult to handle because they are very sensitive to electrostatic discharges. And so, they can break just by holding them in your hands with static charges in your fingers. In the simple integrated circuits, there are protections in place on the die itself to limit the problem, but bigger devices like CPUs are very sensitive to electrostatic discharges, and so they need to be handled with extreme precaution. In this series, we will examine both TTL and CMOS technologies. The TTL family is greatly used when there is a special need for speed, since the CMOS equivalents are slower due to the intrinsic capacitance at the gate of the MOS transistors. CMOS, however, use less space, and so their technology is preferred when building very complex devices where you have to pack many elements, like a CPU. And there is also a trend of building CMOS transistors smaller and smaller on the die. A smaller transistor of course have smaller gates, and therefore a smaller capacitance, which lead to greater speed. One last thing that differentiates the two families is the supply voltage. The TTL family is usually limited to a supply voltage of plus 5 volts. The CMOS family instead can be powered on a vast range of voltages, typically between 1.5 volts and 18 volts. Let's now go back for a moment to the logic states. We have already said that all digital devices work on two states only, the high state and the low state, which are associated with the supply voltage and the ground reference respectively. Any other value of voltage and the input or output of these logic devices is not supported. Or are they? Well, sometimes because the way a circuit is built, it's not possible to achieve exactly those voltage levels. And what would we do then? Put it simply, we define an acceptable range, and we say that all digital devices have to accept anything in that range as a high level, and we do similarly for the low level. And now, thanks to this particular requirement, all the vendors that build digital devices and follow such requirement can be sure that their components will be compatible with similar components from other vendors, and so will be all the customers that buy these components. Welcome to standardization. And now that we have established that digital devices work within voltage ranges rather than the exact voltages, we can define a better way than call those high and low states, and so nobody will get confused, because they won't need anymore to think in terms of ranges of voltage. The adopted way to do so is to use the terms of the Boolean algebra, which was invented by George Boole way before the digital circuits were invented. George Boole created such algebra as a way to easily solve complex logic problems. He realized that any logic statement can be described to be either true or false. Combining several statements, then, becomes a matter of operating with these two states of true and false, and therefore the analysis of several concurrent statements can be done simply by operating appropriately on these two states of true and false.
And so, thanks to that vision of your mathematicians, today we tend to associate the state true with a high state of the digital circuits, and we associate the state false with a low state. And then came the engineers, of course, and they said, why in the world we need to use true and false as the values for making calculations? Why don't we just use numbers? We can associate the state true with the number 1, and the state false with the number 0. And we already have the binary arithmetic made of 1 and 0, so we can easily converge these two concepts. And that's why, today, we use the values of 1 and 0 when we work with digital circuits. With 1 and 0, so we can create a so-called abstraction layer when we do digital circuits design. We can ignore the fact that we are working with TTL circuits or with CMOS circuits, and so we don't have to worry about voltage values, which we know are not the same within the two families of circuits. Only when the design of the logic is done, and when we need to implement it in circuits, then and only then we translate 1s and zeros in voltages. And because we have a standard to follow, everything will just work fine. And here is the table that represents the specifications for the standard which all the manufacturers adopt when designing and building digital components. As you can see, from the first two rows of this table, we can see that the TTL circuits, which are powered with plus 5 volts, everything that is above 2.3 volts is considered a logic 1, and everything that is below 0.08 volts is a logic 0. For the CMOS family instead, since these devices can be powered at different voltages, we cannot use fixed values of voltage to determine the ranges, and so we have a 1 when the voltage exceeds 70% of the value of the supply voltage, and instead we have a 0 when the voltage is below 30% of the value of the supply voltage. And now the problem is, how do we take measurements of digital signals? Mm, well, can we use a multimeter? Of course, we can, but then we need to remember the specs to make sure that the voltages we read are within the required ranges to be a 1 or a 0. So it's possible, but not really practical. Can we use an oscilloscope instead? Same thing, we read voltages, and we need to convert them in our mind to figure out if they are 1s or zeros. But then, is there a practical way to make measurements of digital values? Of course there is, and there are at least two ways. Way number one. We use a so-called logic analyzer. A logic analyzer is like an oscilloscope, but it is capable of making all the calculations to see if the voltages are in the correct ranges to be 1 or 0, and then they show directly a wave signal that represents only those values as VCC or ground, 1 or zeros, No ranges whatsoever. These devices also have several channels, and so you can usually watch 16 or even more digital signals at the same time. So that is very practical, but logic analyzers cost money. They cost at least like a good multi-track oscilloscope. And what if we don't want to spend that amount of money to work on our small projects at home? Well, in that case, way number two. We use a so-called logic probe. A logic probe is a small device capable of testing just one signal at a time and tells us if that signal represents a 1 or a 0 using just a pair of LEDs. There are logic probes that are capable of doing that on TTL signals, and there are those instead that are capable of doing that on CMOS signals. Today, I'm going to show you how to make one, and it will be one that is capable of measuring both TTL and CMOS signals and you can build one with just a few bucks, since it is a very cheap device. Only when you outgrow it because you start working on the complicated circuits that require watching multiple signals at once, you will have to buy and use an actual logic analyzer, but until then, this little device I'm about to present you will do its job very well for many years to come. And even if you one day decide to buy a logic analyzer, the logic probe will still be there for you to use when you don't need the whole power of the mighty logic analyzer. That said, let's take a look at the schematic of such a useful device. Our logic probe is built around a couple of voltage comparators, part of an integrated circuit that contains four of them. We are not going to use the two extra ones. Why comparators? But of course, to be able to measure voltage ranges so the device will take care of making all the conversions between voltages and the logic levels 1 and 0. 
the device, practically, will be powered by the same circuit under test, and so it will be able to know what the value of the supply voltage is, and it will be able to make its deductions in terms of converting the voltages in logic states. The diode D3 is there to prevent the circuit from burning out in case we reverse the supply voltage polarities when we connect the device to the circuit under test. The probe on the left sends the input signals we want to measure to the two comparators. The one on the top will measure the upper range to see if the voltage is equivalent to A1. We will therefore connect the probe to its inverting input, while on the non-inverting input we will put the minimum voltage of the range. Whenever the voltage of the inverting pin will exceed the voltage of the non-inverting pin, the output of the comparator will go low, turning on the LED D1, which we will choose a red color. Similarly, to detect A0, we apply the input voltage to the non-inverting input of the second comparator, and the inverting input instead will be connected to the maximum possible value of the range that represents the zero. This way, whenever the input signal is lower than the signal of the inverting input, the input of the comparator will go low, again, and will turn on the LED D2, this time, which I have chosen to be green. We also have a switch that allows us to change the reference voltage for the comparators, depending on the logic family that we are working with, CMOS or TTL. For CMOS circuits, we set the switch to open, and the voltage dividers made of R7 and R8, and the one made with R5 and R6, will generate the 70 and the 30% of the supply voltage, which are the range boundaries of the digital signals in CMOS family. For TTL circuits, we will close the switch instead, and that will put a couple of more resistors in parallel to those that make the voltage dividers. These new resistors, when the probe is powered with plus 5 volts from the circuit under test, will make sure that the reference voltages will be the ones from TTL circuits, 2.3 volts for the 1 and 0.08 volts for the 0. To use the device, we just set the switch on the appropriate position, depending on if we are working with TTL or CMOS devices. Then we power the probe connecting it to the power supply of the device under test, and then we use the probe tip to read the signals. Depending on the LED that will turn on, we will know if the signal was a 1 or a 0, and if no LED turns on, it means that there is no signal, or that the signal is not in the correct range to be a valid 1 or a valid 0. Let's now look at the prototype on the breadboard to see how the logic probe practically works. As we have seen in the schematic, the logic probe is built around this integrated circuit, an LM339, which contains four voltage comparators, of which we use only two. These are the two LEDs that will provide the logic values. The red LED will light up when the input voltage represents a logical one, while the green LED will light up in the presence of a logical zero. If both LEDs remain off while attempting a measure, it means that the circuit under test is providing a voltage that is outside the correct ranges for 1 and 0. On the other hand, if both LEDs are on, it really means that they are flashing on and off at a frequency that our eye cannot detect, and that is the case when the signal keeps oscillating between the logical values of 1 and 0. And of course, if the frequency is low, we will see the flickering, or even see the LEDs turning on and off alternatively. This one is the switch to select the logic family with which we are working. The current position is for CMOS circuits, and this other position is for TTL circuits. Let's now run a simple test to see how the probe works. And let's start by powering the circuit with a supply of 12 volts, suitable for CMOS circuits. The two LEDs are currently off, as expected, since there is no input signal. We will use this wire to inject a signal to the input of the probe. So, if we use the wire to touch the ground level, the green LED will turn on, to signify that the level is of a logic zero. And if I instead connect the wire to the positive voltage, the red LED will turn on, signifying that now we have a 1 on the input of the probe. And so, basically, we can see how the two LEDs let us see the logic level at the input of the probe. I'm going to change now the supply voltage to 5 volts, leaving the switch on the CMOS position. And you can see how the circuit is still working in the exact same way, showing the 1 and 0 through the two LEDs.
Let's now move the switch to work on the TTL family. And you can see that we can still see the two high and low levels corresponding to the logic 1 and the logic 0. This should be enough for now, and the circuit seems to work fine, and so it is time to assemble the final version of the logic probe, which I am going to build on a perf board. And here it is. This one is the switch that allows the selection of the logic family, this position for CMOS and this one for TTL. This one instead is the chip containing the voltage comparators, and these are the LEDs that allow us to identify ones and zeros. This one is the actual probe, which I made with a piece of thick solid wire. To make it simpler and safer to use, I smoothed up the tip, making it pointy, and I also thinned the tip itself with some solder to avoid oxidation of the copper. I could have just used a smaller perf board to save space and make it a little easier to handle, but this way it was easier to put it together. And finally, these are the alligators that will be connected to the power supply of the circuit under test. Once they are connected, we can go around the circuit and make our measurements. What is left to do now is to put everything in a nice little box so we can handle the probe without touching its circuitry. As I often do, I ended up building the box with my 3D printer. Here is the design I made for it. It is just a squared box with a cover. The box itself has three holes, one for the lid, one for the switch and one for the wires with the alligators a very basic and simple arrangement. The cover has a couple of holes, from which the LEDs can show up, and a couple of indentations aligned with the holes in the box for the switch and the wires. Once the board is seated in the box, we put the cover on top and we can start using the probe right away. As usual, I give you a link in the description below to retrieve the files for the box and for the schematic, so that you can follow my same design to build your own logic probe. Actually, I really suggest you to build your own probe, so it will be easier for you to repeat the experiments that will present you in the future on this series. And here is the printed box for the probe. The circuit is supposed to sit over here, the tip of the probe comes out of this hole, and this other hole is for the switch. On this other side we have the hole for the wires. The lid goes on top of the box and the LEDs are visible through these two holes. Let's now finish the assembly. We just fit the tip of the probe in its hole, we push down the circuit board, we adjust the wires in their hole, and last we put the cover. And now the final testing. To test the probe I built these two simple circuits, a TTL1 and a CMOS1. They are just made of one digital IC each, connected in such a way to provide some logic levels that we can measure with the logic probe. Let's start with the TTL circuit, which I will be powering with a plus 5 volts voltage as required for the TTL family. And now let's connect the wires of the logic probe to the same voltage powering the circuit. At this point we can use the probe to go around and measure the logic values of the pins of the IC. You can now see the LEDs turning on in correspondence of the logic values of the pins and remaining off when there is nothing on the pin. Let's run a test now with the CMOS circuit. At first I am going to use the same 5V supply voltage for now, which is fine for CMOS devices. Then I connect the wires of the probe to this circuit, and then we go around again on the pins of the chip to read the logic values. And again, we can see the LEDs turning on depending on the logic levels of the various pins. Since the CMOS devices can be powered at different voltages, I am now increasing the voltage to plus 12 volts. And now we should read exactly the same values as with the 5 volts supply, which is exactly what's happening. We will use this simple lab instrument in many episodes of this new series on digital electronics fundamentals. It will turn out to be very useful to understand how the circuits that we will assemble work, and it will help us acquire a practical view on the insides of digital electronics. So, get ready for the next episodes of the series, and if you don't want to miss any of them, don't forget to subscribe, if you haven't done so already, and click on the bell. See you in the next video, and as usual, happy experiments!